this video, I'll demonstrate the basics of using Pymol to view a macromolecule. If you have a three-button mouse with a scroll wheel, you might want to grab that. It allows for some neat features to use with Pymol, but if you don't have a mouse, no worries at all. Also, you can passively watch this tutorial, but I find I learn better by doing. So I like to work along with a tutorial, pausing the video to try the commands myself. So if you'd like, open a Pymol window and let's get started. Here I have my open Pymol window with nothing loaded up yet. This is called a graphical user interface, and you may sometimes hear this referred to as a GUI. This panel up here is called the external GUI because in some versions of the program, it might be detached from the lower panel. This bar on the side is the internal GUI. There are actually two command lines for entering typed commands, one here and one here. You can copy and paste commands only into this upper command line that's part of the external GUI. We're not going to focus on the command line too much in this video, but we'll use it to get started since it allows us to pull up a structure easily. This is the viewer. We don't have anything loaded up here yet, so let's use our command line to get a structure. We'll type fetch 6JOL. And now we see a protein in the viewer. This is a receptor protein bound to the cancer drug imatinib, also called Gleevec. We'll use it to explore what we can do in Pymol without using typed commands. Right now, I have a three button mouse hooked up. Down here is the mouse matrix and we can click to switch between viewing and editing mode. We'll only work with viewing mode in this video. It's all we need to begin looking at proteins. With the mouse, we can left click and drag to rotate the structure. If we right click and move up and down, it zooms in and out on the protein. Click the middle button of the scroll wheel and drag to move the entire structure around. The wheel of the scroll wheel itself allows us to shave away layers of the structure in slabs. This is useful if we want to view something in the center of the protein that's blocked by the outer layers of the representation. Different key combinations can be used in conjunction with the mouse to do different things. For example, holding shift while I left click allows me to select part of the protein by drawing a box. You might even pause this video now and play around with the mouse functions a little bit to see what you can do. If you don't have a three button mouse, you can still use Pymol, no problem. Honestly, I really like using my trackpad with the program. Go to this upper mouse menu and select one button viewing mode. Notice the panel down here changes. And now you can use your trackpad in conjunction with the keyboard to do a lot of the same things. Pressing and dragging on my trackpad allows me to rotate the molecule. Option click and drag allows me to move the whole structure. And I can apply clipping by moving two fingers up and down on the trackpad. Pinching my fingers together and apart allows me to control the zoom. Now, since I've moved my structure out of the center of the frame, I'll click Orient on the top of the external GUI and it brings my structure back to its original orientation. The first thing I do after I load a structure is go up to the display menu and turn my sequence on. The one letter codes for the amino acids that make up the protein chain show up at the top of the screen. These grayed out amino acids are part of the protein that the crystallographer knows are there from the sequence, but they can't be seen in this structure. We can change the amino acids to be viewed as three letter codes by changing the sequence mode. So display sequence mode residue names. But I actually recommend using the one letter codes. This is because the protein will be shown as this continuous chain and any breaks in the chain will indicate other unique chains that are present or the ligands bound to a protein. We only have one chain in this protein and STI right here is our ligand 
imatinib. Let's go ahead and click on that. Notice this S-E-L-E -E for the selection lights up. To make this a permanent selection, we'll need to rename it. Click on this A button right here. This stands for Actions and brings up an action menu. Now we can rename it. This pops up right here. We'll delete this and write imatinib. Press Enter and notice the selection has been renamed. Now I can click anywhere in this frame that's not the protein to deselect this. And now if I click anywhere else on the protein, it creates a new selection. But imatinib remains its own separate selection. From the display menu, we can also change the background color. A white background is good for getting a structure ready for publication or maybe a PowerPoint presentation. I like the black background for videos, so I'm just going to go ahead and change it back to black for now. Notice this string of O's. These are oxygen atoms, and they represent the water molecules in this structure. We can see these down here as the little red crosses. Hydrogen atoms are not often shown in representations of proteins, so water just shows up as a chain of O's. Crystal structures contain significant water. If the protein crystal dries out, it can't be expected to maintain the shape necessary for its biological function. So often we'll see water in our structures, unless the crystallographer chooses to omit it. When we first fetch the structure, it'll look like this, or in some older versions of the program, like this. However it first comes up, we're now going to explore how to change this and the different ways we can represent or render this protein. This view is lines, and it shows all of the atoms that make up the amino acids of the protein. We can use these S and H buttons, which stand for show and hide. An important thing to know about Pymol is that when you show different representations, you can add them on top of each other. So let's add sticks on top of the lines. We'll go to our main selection here, 6JOL, and show sticks. The bonds are thicker, and we'll notice that there's a color scheme. This is called CPK coloring, and oxygen atoms are red, nitrogen atoms are blue, sulfur atoms yellow, and phosphorus orange. The carbon atoms are whatever color we decide, and we can recolor the protein using this color button here. Click on it, and color by element will maintain CPK coloring for the other atoms, preserving all that important structural information. I'm partial to this color scheme, which uses white for the carbon atoms. Now let's orient again, and we'll add a cartoon to the overlay. So click Show, Cartoon. This rendering helps us to see the protein secondary structural elements. You might be able to see some alpha helices over here and some beta sheets right here. But things are getting busy, so it might be best to view this by hiding all these individual sticks of the atoms. So now I can use the Hide button and hide the sticks. I would then need to go to Hide and hide the lines, but there's another thing that you can do here. We can use the Show As function. Show As gets rid of any other representations that are in the rendering and changes it to just the one that you select. Remember our ligand? We actually can't see that right now, but we have an imatinib molecule bound to this protein, and it's a small organic molecule. We made this its own selection, and now we can operate on it separately. Well, the cartoon representation is good for proteins, that representation doesn't really make sense for a small organic molecule. So let's show sticks for imatinib. We might really want to highlight the ligand with some contrast, so let's change its color, remembering to color by element to maintain CPK coloring. Now let's use this action button for a matinib to zoom right in on the ligand. So actions, zoom, and notice this red oxygen of a carbonyl group, and these darker blue nitrogens in the structure here. Now you might notice these little kind of cuts in the protein. Notice when I move this, parts get kind of chopped away. Zooming in on a selection introduces some clipping. So this is clipping away the exterior of the protein a little bit so we can see the ligand that we zoomed in on well. Let's orient once more by clicking Orient in the external GUI. 
And now we'll look at the protein a little bit differently. The cartoon shows us the secondary and tertiary structure of the protein, but sometimes we want to see the volume that the protein takes up. For this, let's change to surface view. So 6JOL show as surface. Now we still have CPK coloring, and so we can see some oxygens, nitrogens, and sulfur atoms, but this is making the image a little bit busy. Let's recolor the protein one solid color. So go back to 6JOL, color, and we'll keep it white, so we'll do grays, white. Now, this colored everything, including our selection here, because a matnib is part of this structure. So what I want to do is make sure my imatinib is colored by element once again with that same color scheme. And I want to make sure it sticks, so I'm just going to show as sticks. Now let's rotate the protein and see if we can find a matnib. Oh, check it out. It's sitting in this deep cleft on the receptor. If we change imatinib to spheres, show as spheres, we can see the space that it occupies and retain the CPK coloring. Okay, let's hide the protein surface and add the cartoon back to show us this binding pocket with respect to the protein tertiary structure. Let's click orient again. Yeah, and zoom in a little bit. There we go. You can see how it's deep inside of the, the receptor right here. One of my favorite ways to render a protein is a combination of this cartoon with mesh. I'm gonna show a matnib as sticks again. And now let's add mesh to the overall protein. So it adds the mesh on top, and so we get a sense of the surface area and also uh, where the elements of the secondary structure are located. So it's pretty neat. We can see our um, beta sheets right here and alpha helix and still maintain a sense of the space that the protein occupies. I encourage you now to pause this video and play around with the different ways that you can view the protein and see what you like and see what you think each representation is showing. In this video, we learn to use the fetch command to quickly grab structures. We learn the basics of using a mouse versus a trackpad with Pymol, and we learn to rename selections so that we can keep them separate objects within Pymol that can be operated on individually. We learn to display the sequence, which allows us to find our ligands and water molecules in the structure. We learn the basics of CPK coloring, and some of the different renderings we can use to visualize macromolecules. Learning a new computer program can be a little bit overwhelming, and trust me, I've been frustrated with Pymol plenty of times. But this is a powerful program, and it's amazing to think just one generation ago, widely available free software for 3D modeling didn't exist. So I'd like to conclude by just showing you a couple of structures that have really inspired me. So this is a transfer RNA. And uh, when I first studied this, all I had was the cloverleaf diagram of tRNA in a textbook. I just never imagined that it would look like this in 3D. And if we display the sequence, we now see nucleotides up here. And this, this is DNA wrapped around a histone protein. My professors always talked about the incredible amount of DNA in the nucleus and that histones make this possible, but seeing it for myself for the first time in 3D really wowed me and helped me to appreciate it. There are so many amazing structures to explore, and you can begin searching them yourself at this website. Happy modeling!